They're little histories, but they're intended to throw light on a big transformation in global finance that has these three characteristics to it. The rise of high frequency trading, which you're familiar with. A change in topology, so to speak. Because imagine, say, that you were trading Italian shares uh, 10 years ago. That trading would have taken place within the Borsa Italiana. So the trading would be kind of enveloped by the exchange. And there was nothing specific to Italy about, about that. That would have been the case virtually everywhere. But we've now moved in many countries, not by any means in all countries, to a situation that's inverted, where exchanges and other trading venues are nested within trading, so to speak. They have to mold their characteristics to suit trading, whereas previously it had been the case that traders had to shape their trading practices to fit the exchanges they were trading, trading, trading within. So there's been a kind of topological inversion. And then thirdly, and this is really the most important thing from the viewpoint of what I'm going to say today, there has been not a complete shift, but a partial shift from what I'm calling fixed role markets to all to all markets. So think, for example, about taxis versus Uber. Yeah. To become a taxi driver, as you will know, you need a license. It's a fixed role. <coughs> if you started to drive around, if you have a car and you start to drive around Rome and pick up passengers and charge them, uh, you're quite likely breaking the law uh, <laughs> to do that. It's a, it's a, it's a fixed role. Uh, whereas if you have a car, 
you can anyone who has a car and doesn't have a criminal record and so on can sign up with Uber. Uh, I'm not staying during this trip. I'm not staying in a hotel. I'm staying in an apartment rented first rented via Airbnb. And again, if you <coughs> I imagine if you wanted to and you have an apartment, you live in an apartment, you can rent out a room in the apartment via Airbnb. No issues of tax or anything, anything of that sort. It's not, you don't have to fit within the regulations of hotels. If you have something you want to sell, again it used to be, if you had say, a piece of jewellery that you wanted to sell, you had to take it to an auction house to sell it. Now you can sell it on on eBay. So there's been a big shift from fixed role markets to <coughs> all to all markets within which any participant can trade directly with any other participant. So one of the things I mentioned yesterday is that it's for example that for example there is no high frequency trading of Eurozone government bonds or of British government bonds. Potentially there easily could be because Italian government bonds or British government bonds are very liquid financial instruments. One could imagine there being high frequency trading of them. But there isn't any because that's still a fixed role market. So bo both those sets of bonds are traded electronically but no high frequency tra trading firms are allowed into that market. The central role is still played by dealers, typically big banks. And because, as I, men as I mentioned yesterday, big banks are not very good at high frequency trading. They don't want the competition from high frequency trading firms, so they've managed to keep the door shut to high frequency trading. High frequency trading firms, as I said, are typically small and new. There's only one case that I know of, the big Chicago hedge fund called Citadel. There's only one case where an existing financial institution has successfully become a high frequency trader. All the other firms are firms Automated trading desk, which I'm about to talk about, is just <coughs> the oldest of them, and it was set up in 1988, and that's very old by, by the standards of the industry. Most of the firms were set up only 15, 10 years ago. So they're new, high-technology firms. In some markets, they've been able to get in, and they've been very successful. In other markets, the doors have remained shut. To them. So the circumstances what I'm going to be talking about today is the first important opening of the doors to high frequency trading and I'm going to talk about the process by which those doors were opened. The New York Stock Exchange up to around 10 years ago was a fixed role market. To trade directly on it, you had to buy a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. The prices of seats varied through time, but they were always quite expensive. So for example, at around the time when Automated Trading Desk got going, the cost of a seat in the, on the New York Stock Exchange was around a quarter of a million dollars. And that was beyond, it wasn't possible for Automated Trading Desk, it was a small firm, it, the hundred, and a quarter of a million dollars was of course worth a lot more than it is then than it is now, and they simply did not have the money to buy a seat. <coughs> They could send their orders to the trading floor of the New York Stock Exchange, but not directly. To get onto the trading floor, 
their orders had to pass through the hands of a firm that was a member of the New York Stock Exchange. And the order book that I mentioned yesterday was, as I said yesterday, private. To, for each stock, there was a specific designated trader on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange <coughs> called the specialist. And only the specialist and his clerks could see the book of unfilled orders for a stock. So that the pocket of predictive structure that I called order book <coughs> pressure <coughs> was there, but only the specialist knew of any particular concrete instance of, its, of, 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 of it. So an automated trading desk outside the trading floor had no access to the order book, no access to, therefore, to work out whether there was book pressure at any one moment. So all those, as you can see, are features of a fixed role market. And a fixed role market is a difficult environment for a small new firm. To work with it. But was the specialist bound to secret time, or he could somehow tell? Oh yes, yes, he yes. Could, in principle. Yes. So that, and of course, it was a, the, the trading floor was an environment of interpersonal relationships, friendships, risk reciprocity, and so on. So if I was a specialist, and you came up to me and said, "I have a customer who wants to buy." 50,000 shares of I, IBM, I might, if there was, um, if, if, if there was book pressure, meaning the price was about to go down, I might say to you, if, if I were you, I'd come back in 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. So again, I'm, I'm not going to labor the point of the sociological approach that I'm taking, but again, we're talking about four, the same four ecologies as I was discussing yesterday. And we're talking about what the author I'm drawing on, Andrew Abbott, calls a hinge, which is a process that links two ecologies. And here, the hinge in question is one that links the ecology of trading to the ecology of exchanges and other trading venues. So, uh, so as I said, my two micro histories, automated trading desk, are an island, are linked, and they are linked by a hinge, as I'll explain later in the talk. So, the first micro history, automated trading desk, one of the oldest, perhaps the oldest, the other candidate is the very secretive hedge fund renaissance and I haven't been able to do any interviews at renaissance so I can't, simply cannot tell whether a renaissance uh, got going in high frequency trading earlier than automated trading desk or not. And it wasn't set up in one of the United States' major financial centers. It was set up in the rather lovely town of <laughs> Charleston, South Carolina. So just to give you a sense of environment, I'll take you on a trip I did to Charleston uh, two years ago. So lots of lovely churches. The shaded paths of the College of Charleston, almost as nice as the environs of the Villa Merifiori. Um, <laughs> those, are, those are what in the south are called live oaks, and what you can perhaps just about see Drake from them is, is, is what's called Spanish moss. But of course, a place also with a disturbing history. This was once the main slave port of North America. We're actually not going to delay in Charleston. We're going to take the Ravenel Bridge across the Cooper River. That's the river up which the slave ships sailed. And if you do that and you carry on for 
three or four kilometers and take a left, you go into rather pleasant little low-rise suburban development. To those buildings, they look more attractive on the other side, but I can explain why I had to take these pictures very quickly, <coughs> if you like, in, in our discussion. And that's the headquarters of automated trading desks. So in fact, it's, it's in Mount Pleasant, next door to Charleston. It's basically a suburb of Charleston across the Hoover River. It was set up in 1988 by these two people, the economist David Whitcomb, picture at the top, who taught economics at Rutgers University in New Jersey, and a former student of his, James Hawkes, who taught statistics at the College of Charleston. So that's why the firm was set up in Charleston. Many of its staff were graduates of the College of Charleston. At its peak, in the early 2000s, Automated Trading Desk was responsible for approximately 8% of all share trading in the United States. So, quite a big chunk. It was bought in 2007 by the big bank Citigroup for $680 million. Hmm. More than the the, the people involved tell me that that was more than they reckoned the firm was actually worth. <coughs> Automated trading desk have just sold it 10 days ago <coughs> to, Chicago, to the Citadel, the Chicago hedge fund, and I'm told that they sold it for less than 1% of what they bought it for. So big banks are really not very good at this business. What led Whitcomb and Hawks to this enterprise was nothing directly to do, for example, with Hawks's economics, but to do with their previous efforts to predict the outcomes of horse races. Whitcomb and Hawks wrote a simple little model basically a regression equation, to predict the speed of each horse in a race, and therefore to predict the winner of the race. Horse racing, horse betting, I beg your pardon, though, at least in those days in the United States, was a fixed rule market. You had to bet via bookmakers, and bookmakers set their odds in a way that was unfavorable to the gambler and of course favorable to the bookmaker. So they ended up in a situation that they had a model that did have some predictive power, but they couldn't make money using it because the odds were too unfavorable. And that in a certain sense was exactly the situation they found themselves in when they started the automated trading of shares. As I said, the New York Stock Exchange, and that was the first main market on which they traded, was a fixed role market. And they had these, these systematic disadvantages. Uh, as I said, they, their orders had to be transmitted via a firm that was a member of the New York Stock Exchange. And those firms charged high commissions in the late 1980s, an average of seven cents per share traded. So a share might be price of perhaps $30 and a fee of seven cents. Yeah, from the viewpoint of an 
investor who is going to hold the share for several years, that's perfectly okay. But if you're trading fast and you're going to hold a share for maybe a minute and then you're going to repeat this trade time and time and time again, seven cents per share is actually a cripplingly large amount of money to have to pay. Then secondly, the execution of orders was not fully automatic. The specialist had to press enter on his keyboard and could delay the execution of an order to a time that was favourable to the specialist, but perhaps unfavourable to automated trading desks. And <clears throat> very worryingly, if automated trading desks decided to cancel an order, acknowledgement of the fact that they had cancelled the order might be slow to arrive. And I know you've been doing some, some, some trading, so you'll know that it's just as important to be able to cancel an order as to place an order. And if you're a high frequency trading firm, speed of cancellation is just as important as speed of order placement. And as I've already said, the book was private to the specialists. Automated trading desks, computers had no access to the New York Stock Exchange book. So no way of identifying book pressure. But once again, the model that Whitcomb wrote did have some predictive power. And in particular, it got its predictive power from futures lag, the pocket of predictive structure that I was talking about yesterday. Whitcomb managed to negotiate a reduced commission from a big investment bank, a reduced commission of three cents per share rather than the standard seven cents per share. And the offices of automated trading desk were linked by high-speed telephone line and high-speed modem to the investment bank's offices in Manhattan and from those to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. The main trading test that they did was in April and May of 1990. And during that test, automated trading desks traded 3.2 million shares. Again, the model did have some predictive power, and its tra automated trading desk trading made an average profit of 1.9 cents per share traded, which may not sound a lot, but the average profit per share traded of high frequency trading today would be something like a twentieth of a cent. Per share. So this is actually a very, very healthy rate of profit for a high frequency trading firm. But unfortunately, as I just said, automated trading desk was paying commissions of three cents per share traded. So it was making a loss. So again, just the same situation of Whitcomb and Hawks in horse racing. Again, the problem of the fixed role mark the fact that it could not trade directly. It had to trade via intermediaries, via a firm that was a member of the New York Stock Exchange. What then happened, automated trading desk could easily simply buy a business at that point, but what then happened is that the investment bank, a member of the New York Stock Exchange via which they were trading, noticed the fact that the firm's model was predictably successful. So they offered automated trading desk a specially reduced commission of 1.4 cents. In other words, enough to move the trading into profit, but at the cost of three quarters of the firm's profits. And that's, of course, a typical situation of a fixed role market, that the customer, an automated trading desk, was a customer, 
the customer is in a less powerful position than the insider. So the insider can dictate the terms. You can trade, but I'm going to take three quarters of any profit that you manage to make. Whitcomb didn't object to this. And it's, this is indicative of the power of was still a largely intact fixed role market. But this struck Whitcomb, and he told me this in an interview, this struck him as a perfectly equitable deal. Reduced commission, but you have to pay over three quarters of your profit. That seemed to him to be fair. But in fact, what then happened is that the profitability of ATD's trading on the New York Stock Exchange went down and down and down. By 1994, it was essentially making no profit at all. The model had kind of gotten stale, and this goes off as what happens to the majority of models in high frequency trading, that they start by working and then they work less and less. Yes. What saved automated trading desk from what would otherwise have been bankruptcy was a shift from the number one market in the, in the United States, the New York Stock Exchange, to the number two market, NASDAQ. Differently structured from the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ had no trading floor. Most of the trading on NASDAQ was done via telephone. But though differently structured, it too was a fixed role market. You had to be a member of the National Association of Securities Dealers to trade directly on NASDAQ. Once you were a member of the National Association of Securities Dealers, you then had to apply to become a market maker. And only if you were authorized to be a market maker were you allowed to post bids and asks, offers to sell on NASDAQ screens. As I said, the, the market worked essentially by screen and by telephone, no direct inter interaction on a human trading floor. The key insider role were played by broker-dealers, such as the one led by Bernard L. Maidon, who of course has become very famous as the largest fraudster in financial history. It's one of the Puzzles. Uh, I've interviewed several people who know Maidon. It's one of the puzzles that they have. Why on earth did this man run his Ponzi scheme? Because his business as a NASDAQ broker dealer was perfectly profitable. He didn't need the money that the, the Ponzi scheme uh, brought, brought him. This is a picture of its offices, probably taken around about 2000, just in the nature of the screens and so on uh, in, in the office. If you wanted to trade, Na trade NASDAQ's shares, at least in any volume, what you had to do is to phone up a firm such as Madoff Securities. Mm -hmm. You could see the prices on NASDAQ screens, but in order to trade, you had to, f you had to telephone a broker dealer such as made up securities. That was the key fixed role in that market. So what you would see on your screen would be something like this. So the four letter acronyms that you can see are the acronyms of the broker dealers. My apologies, this and Several other pictures uh, in this set of slides are taken from the very early days of the internet when the resolution of pictures did not 
very high, so everything is also really pixel muted. Um, so you can, for example, see here this on this on the left are the broker dealers bid prices. Those on the right are the broker dealers ask prices. And this is the price at which broker dealers say they will buy, and those are the prices at which broker dealers say they will sell. So, and these are the acronyms of the various broker dealers. So, for example, that's GSCO, which is Goldman Sachs and company. So, as you can see, it's not an anonymous market, and it couldn't be an anonymous market because, of course, you had to know who to phone. So, you as the investor look at that screen and you say, Oh, I want to sell the highest bid price that's available is Lehman Brothers, $46 for this chair. So I'm going to get on the phone to the offices of Lehman Brothers, and you hope that when you start that conversation, their bid for $46 is still good. Might well not be, but you hope that it's still good, so that you will indeed be able to sell your shares to Lehman Brothers for $46, rather than $45 and 15 sixteenths. This, this, is the the tiny, uh, this is the tiny fraction that can be exchanged, one sixteen? Yes, yes. And indeed, that dates it. Um, the book for which I got this picture is from 1999. Had it been four or five ye years earlier, the, the, top, the lowest fraction would have been an eighth, an eighth of a dollar, or indeed in practice a quarter of a dollar. And there's a story there which we can come back to in the discussion, if you like. But only those firms, the designated broker-dealers, could enter bids and asks onto the NASDAQ screen. Again, a firm such as Automated Trading Desk wasn't allowed to do that. They didn't have, this is what's called a level two screen, and any professional trader could get access to a level two screen but only a designated broker-dealer got the level 3 access that allowed you to post bids and asks on the NASDAQ screens. So again, a fixed role market, but a very tiny vulnerability in that fixed role setup that was indirectly created by the 1987 stock market crash. I mentioned it yesterday, prices falling by 20% in a single day. Lots of desperate investors trying to phone up their broker-dealer, say, sell, sell, sell. And the broker-dealer not picking up the telephone. So after the crisis, the Securities and Exchange Commission forced upon the National Association of Securities Dealers a rule to say that if an order was received via NASDAQ's small order execution system, which would be the system that an investor who was a member of the general public would use, you could use it only for orders up to a thousand shares, so that's not actually much use to you if you're a big institutional investor, but if you're a small investor, a thousand shares, perfectly adequate. This had been set up by NASDAQ just to make the thing more efficient. They didn't want the phones always to be ringing with tiny orders, so they set up the small order execution system in order to process small orders automatically. And the, NAS, and the rule the Securities and Exchange Commission put in place was that the broker-dealers had to honour the bid prices and the ask prices on their screens if they received an order via SOS, via the small order execution systems. They didn't have to honour the prices if they got a telephone call. But if the price came, if the, if the order came in via SOS, they had to honor it. And that made possible a 
form of trading that became known as sos banditry. The man standing in, rather portly man standing in the centre of that photograph is the man who claimed to have been the first sos bandit, a man called Harvey Meekin. Whether that's really true or not is can't really be determined. But the idea of sos banditry was that the prices that the Nasdaq broker dealers posted on their screens could become stale. That's to say, they, the, the prices were not being generated automatically. A human being working for a broker dealer had to change them. And sometimes those human beings were just not paying enough attention to the market. So the market might shift, but there might be still a bid or an ask it didn't reflect the changing prices. So you would, as a sauce bandit, you would quickly put in an order and trade against those sauce, uh, trade against those stale prices. And because of a new rule, the broker dealer had to honour that bid or ask. It wasn't by any means a safe form of trading. I know some of you have read Scott Patterson's book, Dark Pools. Um, so there's a wonderful description in Dark Pools. Patterson is the only author I know who's got the culture of NASDAQ trading in the 1990s right. There's a wonderful description. Uh, this, this all looks too nice in this, in this picture. The trading rooms were horrible. So places, you know, sort of makeshift trading rooms. There were hundreds and hundreds of people, typically in run-down parts of lower Manhattan, were doing this. Almost all of them were men, you know, all crammed together in makeshift trading rooms. It gets pretty hot in lower Manhattan in summer, so people were sweating and it was kind of, it would kind of get smelly. And sometimes, if, if a trade went wrong, because these, these were people who were trading on their own account, so if there was a loss, it was their own money they were losing. There's a wonderful description of someone who's just made a big loss, vomiting, but still keeping trading while vomiting. So expanded, by the way, that was, that was what the NASDAQ broker dealers called them. It was deliberately a pejorative turn of phrase. Because, of course, when the Sous Bandit was successful, he, and again, they were nearly all men, he was successful at the expense of a broker-dealer. So the broker-dealers hated this activity. How Sous Bandits did it was essentially by monitoring, this is a later um, screenshot, I deliberately chose it because you can see it just a little bit more clearly uh, than the genuine screenshot from the 19, 1990s. Automated trading desks essentially went and they interviewed those bandits. They asked them, how do you do it? How, what, what, you know, what form of reasoning are you employing when you're trading on NASDAQ? And as you can see, what they were told, and this is correct, this was later in effect verified um, by a paper in the econometric literature where a couple of economists had access to the trading, trading records of two source founded firms. They watched what was happening to the bids and offers on NASDAQ screens, watching for broker dealers leaving the best bid or ask. So for example, if we look here, a whole lot of firms are offering to sell shares. This is Netscape, the early browser firm. <coughs> there are a whole lot of a whole lot of broker-dealers are 
offering to sell shares at $28 and a quarter. And what the bandits looked for was someone, a broker dealer or a set of broker dealers, leaving the best bid or ask. So in the case of an ask, that would mean increasing their ask price, asking for $28.50, perhaps rather than $28 and a quarter dollars in order to sell shares to the, to the investor. They'd be like two people left, lower their bids, or Goldman leads in this stock, so I saw Goldman leave, so I hit the stock. That's the equivalent process uh, on in, in the bids. So broker dealers start knowing the bids, then very quickly a bandit would themselves sell shares in anticipation of the prices going down. Most probably, the reason why this little topic of predictive structure existed, because once again, we're talking, if, price, if prices had moved entirely randomly, then so bandits couldn't have made money. But they did make money, and this form of reasoning, where you closely watch what is happening on those screens with the best bids and the best asks. Almost certainly the reason this pocket of predictive structure came into being is that the broker dealers were often handling big customer orders, not for a thousand shares, but perhaps for 50,000 or 100,000 or a million shares. And so if you were, for example, selling a broker dealer and you're a customer who wanted to sell a million shares, then the first thing you would do as a broker dealer is to reduce your buy, your bids, your, 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 your bids to buy, because you knew that a sale of a million shares is going to push prices down. So the last thing you wanted is inadvertently to buy those shares when their prices were about to fall. So if you were an attentive SOS bandit, you could detect that process starting. Fierce conflict between, on the one hand, the NASDAQ broker dealers and on the other hand, the SOS bandits. So this is Broad Street in lower Manhattan. That's the frontage of the New York Stock Exchange. There. But if you carry, down, carry on down, you can't quite see it because the picture gets fuzzy in the background. But if you carry on down Broad Street for something like 80 meters, on the right hand side, there's number 50 Broad Street, where the offices, where amongst the offices in that building were two, were, were, were two SOS bandit firms, Daytech and Broadway Trading. Then across the road, on the other side, at 43 Broad Street, there was Vanderbilt Securities, which was an official NASDAQ broker dealer. And Scott Patterson tells this wonderful story of a trader in Vanderbilt Securities at the, at the official bro broker dealer, getting infuriated at being sosed, as people called it, by a trader over in the offices of Daytech on the other side of the road. And as you can see, it's not anonymous, so you know who it is that's <laughs> who is managing to rip you off. So he, he came rushing out of 43 Broad Street <laughs> across the street into the Daytech trading room at, at, in, at, at, at number 50, ran to the, to the offending trader, shouted, you did it again, I'll fucking kill you. <laughs> Standing there was a leading SOS bandit figure, a very colourful character called Sheldon Mashler. Mashler picked up a knife. Fortunately, it was just a letter opener, so it wasn't a very dangerous and stabbed him. This was a, a very few, if you, were, if you were a SOS bandit, you would frequently get death threats from 
broker, dealer, broker dealers. So this is a very sharp conflict, perhaps the sharpest internal conflict in the US financial markets in the post-war period. So this then is the context for the second of the two micro-histories that I'm about to tell you. And for me, it began in October 2011. I was standing outside of this building, which is the Trump International Hotel. And Tower Donald Trump wasn't quite as famous in 2011 as, as he is now. This is not the Trump Tower. This is this was not his, this is not his original building uh, in New York. This is a later one, a fair but a very fine skyscraper on Central Park. And inside, the Palm Beach building on the left, uh, there's a three-star Michelin restaurant called Jean George. And I've been invited out to lunch, and I was feeling a little bit nervous. Partly because I was worried I might have to pay for the lunch. It's <laughs> a three-star Michelin restaurant. But also, I was there to meet a man who has chosen privacy. There are only two pictures of him in the public domain. This is one of those two pictures. It's a man called Josh Levine. Probably more important. That's Coney Island. That's Coney, exactly. Yeah, exactly. We'll talk about Coney Island in a second. Levine is probably the single most important figure in the transformation of finance that's made high frequency trading possible. But as I said, he's chosen privacy. And largely, not completely anonymity, but largely anonymity. That's one of the only two pictures. And as Emiliano has just said, this is Coney Island. This is him on his wedding day in 1998, his wedding to Meredith in 1998. By 1998, Josh Levine was already a millionaire. He could have had his wedding photographs taken on any beach in the world. But he had them taken on the beach at Coney Island, which is not a classy tourist destination. I don't know if there's anywhere equivalent in the Lido de Roma or somewhere that yeah. would be the equivalent of Coney Island. It's a place you go if you're poor, yeah. if you don't have enough money to go swim in a nice environment. So he chooses to have his wedding photographs taken in Coney Island. Why he is so important to the history of high frequency trading is this, this new trading venue, Island. This was the only remaining trace of Island two years ago, even this is now disappear. This is the frontage of 50 Broad Street, the, fir, the, the building in which that stabbing took place. As you can see, it's now at the point where I took that photograph. It was an unoccupied storefront. That picture, the wedding picture, comes from one of those wonderful internet discoveries, the old index of josh.com, Josh Levine's website. And just think for just a second what it means to own that domain name, josh.com. That means you were right in there at the very beginnings of the internet. I'll just point this out to you. Again, I have seen probably this is a bit hard to read. That's the fantastic island ECN. ECN, the acronym of Electronic Communications Network. 
the new trending value, and then this, the watcher, that was essentially a trading station, a workstation for trading, designed by Levine for South Bandits. But it's interesting to notice what it says. The watcher, power to the people, and that's of course a kind of activist's sort of slogan. And that captures something about Ireland. This is the other picture of Levine that's in the public domain, almost certainly taken through a web webcam. This is Datex offices at 50 Broad Street. This is this is where the stabbing took place. That's where Ireland was <coughs> set up. Josh.com had a little electronic bell on it. And anyone who was browsing the internet could press with their mouse the little electronic bell. And if they did that, the webcam was always was always on. Levine and also Datex Chief Technology Officer, Peter Stern, they would get up and dance <laughs> for a few seconds. They were information libertarians. Information wants to be free. If you want to have a webcam trained on you all the time, that's that's okay. You can you can you can do that. Ireland developed out of the workstation for trading that Levine designed and was called Watcher. And originally Ireland was simply a way by which different Soas bandits could trade with each other rather than via a NASDAQ broker dealer. Because if it was fine if you were a bandit, you could use SOS, the small order execution system, to put a trading position on, but only if you were very lucky could you use SOS to liquidate that trading position as a profit. So what Ireland allowed two SOS bandits to do was to trade with each other, particularly to liquidate their, their profitable positions. This is the island logo again. You probably can't quite read that. Island ECN giving you the power to move the market. I interviewed Matt and Reason, who became the chief executive officer. Levine basically ran Island to begin with, but then didn't want the hassle of being the chief executive of what was becoming quite a successful business. So he passed the leadership to Matt Andreessen. And Andreessen used, when I interviewed him, a phrase which I must confess I didn't immediately recognize, but a trader who, to whom I showed the paper that I eventually wrote with my colleague Juan Pablo Parvigueira on Ireland. I ran it past a trader and he recognized it as a quote from Coppola's famous film Apocalypse Now. So the phrase describing Ireland that in recent years was cold rice and rat meat. And that is an almost direct quotation. Charlie didn't get much USO. Charlie was what American soldiers called the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese forces. So this is the communist enemy the Vietnam War. Charlie didn't get much USO. The USO, United Services Organization, provides rest and recreation to US armed services. Charlie, i.e. the communists, was dug in too deep or moved too fast. His idea of a great R&R, &R, rest and recreation, was cold rice and a little rat meat. So again, <coughs> you notice what is quite a surprising invocation 
here. Here is the chief executive of a very successful trading company invo invoking the Vietnamese communists, invoking Charlie, the Viet Cong, cold rice and the little rat meat. And indeed, invocation of rats wasn't simply a metaphor in Broad Street. Downtown Manhattan has been pretty much gentrified in recent years, but in the 1990s, it was a pretty rough, a pretty run-down kind of place. Running just behind Broad Street is New Street, which is essentially an alley, and there were lots of rats in New Street. Ireland's offices, as an interviewee from Ireland put it, are full, were full of piles of garbage, and indeed, if you look behind Levine, you can see sort of bits of garbage uh, on the floor. The roof tiles were, sta straight, were, were stained. Levine, who was wonderfully eccentric, had a toddler's paddling pool. That translate into Italian, okay, paddling pool. So it's, it's a sort of rubber. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there was a paddling pool with turtles. Turtle. Real turtles. Real turtles. Real, Real turtles. And if you joined Ireland, the most unpleasant job as a new member of staff you had was to change the water from <laughs> the turtles. What I would offer was this unprecedentedly low fees, a quarter of a cent per share. Between Remember, New York Stock Exchange at roughly that period, seven cents per share. Here, a quarter of a cent per share. One of the very earliest, perhaps even basically the second public limit order book. So again, you remember from last time, the order book the list of the bids to buy and offers to sell. Most venues that had order books, the order book was private, as on the New York Stock Exchange. Ireland's order book was public. The firm ran a very successful campaign, advertising campaign around the slogan, we'll show you our book. Why won't they? In other words, why won't the New York Stock Exchange show you the order book? Levine even wrote a little program called Book Viewer, which meant that not just a subscriber to Ireland, but anyone with an internet browser could see the book of bids and offers on Ireland. So once again, the information libertarianism, information wants to be free. Levine was a very skilled programmer and wrote a matching engine for Ireland. The matching engine is the program that manages the order book and looks for matches for bids to buy and offers to sell at the same price. The matching engine is what consummates those trades. Ireland's matching engine was unprecedentedly fast. It would consummate a trade in something like two milliseconds, two thousand or two thousand of a second. Whereas the only other venue that had the public limit order book in the mid 1990s was a venue called Instanet, and on Instanet, the matching engine would take about two seconds <laughs> to consummate a trade. Two milliseconds is, of course, way below the human perception of time. So the smallest time interval that a human being perceives is around 100 milliseconds, is around a tenth of a second. So from the viewpoint of a human trader, two milliseconds is essentially instantaneous. Levine designed a protocol called H. 
which sent out all the changes in the order book. So a computer system linked to itch could automatically update its mirror file in the order book. You could enter via a, another protocol called ouch. You didn't have to simulate the keyboard and mouse. You could directly connect a computer to Highlands Matching Engine via the ouch protocol. You could co-locate, which of course has become one of the dominant characteristics of high-frequency trading. The trading firm server being right next to the matching engine. So the matching engine for Ireland was in the basement of 50 Broad Street and there was a web services firm in the building. So you could place your server in the same building as the, as the matching engine. An automated trading firm desk was the first outside firm to trade on Ireland. So this becomes the hinge that has transformed share trading in the United States. In, in the ecology of trading, the emergence of automated market making. Market making is continuously having bids and offers in the order book in the hope of making as a profit the difference in price. So, in this hypothetical example of an order book, the highest bids to buy are at $44.99. And let's say there's 100 shares there bid to buy. And 100 shares offered to sell at $45. Oh, you a pointer, wonderful. It's not really a pointer, but you can use yeah, it as yeah, a pointer. Yeah. <laughs> And if you're an automated market maker, that's what you're trying to do. To always have a bid to buy at a good price <coughs> and, a bid to buy, and an offer to sell at a good price. And you hope that someone else is going to execute against your bid to buy and your offer to sell. And you're going to make a cent per share on your hundred shares. So in other words, you can make a dollar and a fact. Now, of course, you have to do that many, many, many times, but that's exactly what automated trading is and the other automated firms started to do. So that the characteristics of Ireland made it the perfect venue for automated market making. And the presence of automated market making on Ireland made it an excellent venue on which to trade. Because you could find keenly priced bids to buy and offers to sell. Not a sixteenth of a dollar apart or an eighth of a dollar apart. But Levine had a very fine price grid of, a hundred, of 256 of a dollar. So you could find bids to buy and offers to sell that were just marginally better prices than the NASDAQ official broker dealers would offer you. So venues such as Ireland and other similar electronic communications networks got going in the late 1990s took more and more business away from NASDAQ's official broker dealers. They started to break down the fixed role market structure. Even the New York Stock Exchange eventually, so there's eight, well, just 80 yards from Ireland's, 80, 80 meters from Ireland's offices, but eventually both NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange had to change themselves to become more like Ireland, to have a limit order book. The 
that any participant could see, to offer co-location, to offer the facilities for automated trading, to reduce their fees dramatically. The only way they survived was be by becoming like their new competitors. The same process has happened in Europe. I'm sure you'll recognize this. This is the, the fine palace occupied in Milano by the, 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 the Borsa Italiana. The key vehicle of the transformation in Europe was a new trading venue set up in 2007 called Chiex. And Chiex's matching engine was written by two island programmers. So it's a matching engine in the direct tradition of Josh Levine and the island matching engine. Another new venue, Bax Europe, again, American, um, American originated, uh, set up in 2008. The same process in share trading in Europe. They established venues such as the London, London Stock Exchange and the Borsa Italiana in order to survive in the face of the new competition from chi -X and Bats Europe that had to change themselves so that they become more like the new competitors. So, my two micro-histories then are designed to throw light on this big set of processes. The rise of high-frequency trading, the shift from fixed-roll markets to all-to-all -all markets, and the situation where rather than trading taking place within exchanges, exchanges now have to survive and fashion themselves to make themselves fit within the new ecology of automated high frequency trading. Share trading in Europe and the United States has been transformed utterly by this process, but not all financial markets have been transformed by it. As I've already said, Eurozone government bonds are not the subject of high frequency trading. And to explain all of that, I would have had to bring in the domains of regulation and politics. We can't just look at trading and exchanges to, to explain that. But I think that's enough for, for now. Thank you, Don. Maybe we could have a break. Yeah. Well, ten minutes. mancano proprio eh? alcuni mancano eh sì alcuni l'avevano detto mi sa che oggi c'erano un po' di esoni un po' di